Okay, so we can go ahead and get started now. Okay, hello everyone. I'm Liz Herkey with the Animals and Society Institute. And on behalf of myself and Carol Glasser of the American Sociological Association, welcome to the February 2024 Animals and Society Colloquium. Today, we're gonna to hear from Dr. Cameron Whitley and Caitlin Burrailler. Their talk is entitled Brainless Beauties, Assessing How Zoos aquari and Aquariums Depict Marine Animals Without Faces. Now, before we jump into the program, I wanna tell you a little bit about this series. The series is the brainchild of Carol Glasser and a joint project between the Animals and Society section of the American Sociological Association and the Animals and Society Institute. Now, if you are a sociologist, we hope you will consider joining ASA and joining the Animals and Society section. For those of you not familiar with the Animals and Society Institute, ASI is dedicated to furthering the field of human animal studies as it concerns the complex relationship between humans and other animals. ASI has two managed academic journals, a book series on human animal studies, and loads of resources for scholars, researchers, faculty, and mental health professionals, all on our website and including a database of HAS-related academic programs. Our HAS director, Gala Argent, produces a monthly report chock full of information about the field, including news, conferences, publications, calls for papers, job opportunities, and grant funding. And we'll put the links to all of these resources in the chat for you. We encourage everyone, non-academics or academics of any discipline to sign up for the newsletter. It's a valuable resource and we hope you'll check it out along with the resources on the website. So now on to the talk. I do want to remind you that Carol will be Carol will be monitoring the chat. So if you would prefer to ask your questions in that way, uh, please put them in the chat. And we will hold off on questions until after the talk. I'm thrilled to introduce our speakers today. Dr. Cameron Whitley is an associate professor at Western Washington University in the Department of Sociology. He has published over 60 articles and book chapters on conservation approaches, human-animal relationships, and LGBTQ plus identity related to environmental concern and health outcomes. He received a five-year early career NSF grant to study how animal imagery can be better used to enhance empathy for animals and conservation efforts. Caitlin Burraller graduated from the Department of Sociology at Western Washington University. She has a particular interest in exploring human, I'm sorry, in exploring animal depictions and conservation efforts for animals deemed without faces. Her initial focus in this area was to better understand how the public was interpreting and engaging the impact of wasting disease on sea stars in the Pacific Northwest. Dr. Whitley, I turn it over to you. Wonderful, thank you, Liz. Um, as I get this set up here, there we go. There we go. So everyone should be able to see that. Um, uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm Cameron Whitley, and my co-presenter, uh, as Liz mentioned, is Caitlin Burrailler. Uh, Caitlin was my undergrad, and I see, um, I wanted to point out that Eleanor Hubbard is on here. I, Eleanor Hubbard was my undergraduate honors thesis advisor. So in some ways, I feel like this is coming full circle um, with doing this presentation with Eleanor in the room and having Caitlin involved in this. Um, this has been a really fun project for us. And what I really want to uh, reiterate in this kind of in this opening is that this the majority of this project, the writing, um, a lot of the conceptualization and thinking through this was really Caitlin's work um, and Caitlin's undergraduate thesis. But before I uh, hand it over to Caitlin to talk a little bit about that process, I want to talk about our title for a second. Um, our title is Brainless Beauties Assessing How Zoos and Aquariums Depict Marine Animals Without Faces. Uh, we initially chose this title because it's kind of provocative. And it really highlights one of the components um, of our findings in this process. But, oh no, let's see here. 
sorry, there we go. Um, in hindsight, sorry, there we go. Uh, and then in consultation with the Woodland Park Zoo and the Seattle Aquarium, who are also joining us as partners on this day, we have modified our paper title at least to be going with the flow, how zoos and aquariums depict marine animals without faces. So we think that this is a more appropriate title as we do not want to contribute uh, to the further association of moths or marine animals without faces as brainless beauties. So now let's go with the flow as I turn it over to Caitlin to talk a little bit about how she got into this line of research. Caitlin. Awesome. Thank you, Cam. Hi, folks. I am so stoked to get the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, my name is Caitlin Brailler. I just recently graduated from Western Washington University with a BA in sociology. Um, I was originally interested in researching moths for my thesis because I had noticed how few people had heard about sea star wasting syndrome, uh, despite its devastating effects on sea star populations here along the Pacific coast. And I started wondering what efforts were being made to protect marine invertebrates, specifically those without faces. Uh, we conceptualized this research together, both taking an interest in the subject and after being given an outline for our methods, I set about combing through all AZA accredited organization websites, collecting images and texts that related to corals, jellies, and sea stars. Wonderful. Thank you, Caitlin. Uh, for the remainder of this presentation, we're going to be following a pretty traditional uh, format. And we're going to give you a journey through our analysis of marine animals without faces and how these animals are profiled across zoo and aquarium websites. Kayla will start by giving us all an overview and some context about this topic, why it's important, followed by a little introduction. Some of us are more familiar with moths than others. So we will make sure that we are all on the same page. Page We will provide a little bit of overview about what science says about moths, about moth depiction, and what we know about the use of anthropomorphism in terms of generating empathy for animals and promoting conservation. I will share where we got our data from and how we coded for themes. We will then take turns discussing the themes we identified and what these things might mean. We will end our presentation summarizing some key ideas and insights, making recommendations and talking about the limitations. At the end, we will open it up for questions and conversation. Awesome. So let's just get right into it. Um, let's talk a little bit about why moths. Uh, starting in 2013, sea star wasting syndrome devastated over 20 different populations of sea stars ranging from as far north as Alaska down to the Mexican coast. And as a result of this die-off, sunflower sea stars specifically are now listed as critically endangered by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. And this is just one example of an endangered essential moth, but over 90% of marine animals are invertebrates, many of which don't have faces. So moths are critical animals in our ecosystems and their conservation is essential. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more later about the specific essential roles that these three moths play in the ecosystem. But for now, it's important to know that they're critical for promoting biodiversity, maintaining a balanced ecosystem and encouraging resilience against the effects of climate change. As forward-facing institutions that have direct connections with the public, zoos and aquariums are positioned to play an important role in conservation efforts. And while there is some debate as to how much impact zoos and aquariums directly have on conservation attitudes, it is known that how an animal is depicted that will have a direct impact on public perceptions of said animal. So understanding moth depictions is essential to aiding in their conservation. And that's ultimately what led us to our research question. So we arrived at a research question because most studies that assess marine animal depictions focus solely on charismatic megafauna, such as sea turtles, sea otters, um, several species of whales and fish. And we're hoping to aid in filling this gap in knowledge by specifically looking at depictions of sea stars, corals, and jellies on all AZA accredited organization websites. So our research question is, how are moths depicted across zoo and aquarium websites? So then next, we're going to do a little bit of background about our three specific moths. Um, to understand the importance of moths, we need to look at the roles that they play. 
So as mentioned before, 90% of marine organisms are invertebrates. And for this project, we selected three highly recognizable moths that people have generally positive or neutral perceptions of. And these three are sea stars, jellies, and corals. So sea stars are critical to the ecosystem as they prey heavily on sea urchins. And urchins, when populations are unchecked, can decimate entire kelp forests. And kelp provides shelter and resources for many different marine species. And kelp forests can also act as a carbon dioxide sink. And we've seen this here on the Pacific coast, where sea star wasting a disease has resulted in a significant decline in sunflower sea star populations. And as a result of this, kelp forests all along the Pacific coast are being threatened by overconsumption from sea urchins, ultimately leading to a decrease in marine biodiversity. And then we have jellies. And jellies play a similar role to sea stars in that they also prey on eggs and larvae. Um, but jellies are also a vital food source for many animals, such as birds, turtles, octopi, crabs. However, climate change has resulted in problematically large swaths of jellies, and these are referred to as jelly blooms. And these blooms can actually undermine biodiversity, they can cause human injury, and they can potentially reduce fish stocks as well. And then lastly, we have coral, and coral plays a vital role because it provides habitat for many marine species, and it also helps protect coastlines from storms. And like sea stars, coral has faced a massive die-off caused by increasing ocean temperatures. Over half of the world's coral reefs have died since the 1950s, and coral organisms provide a foundation for flourishing biodiversity, and this biodiversity in turn increases resilience to a changing climate. So now that we know a little bit more about our three chosen moths, let's take a look at how they're depicted. So studies have shown that people generally tend to undervalue moths, and in some cases they overlook these animals entirely because of a lack of knowledge regarding their behaviors. And many people are unsure about the animal's ability to feel pain, um, they're unsure about the animal's cognitive ability, and in some cases they aren't quite sure about their status as an animal at all because the animal in question lacks anthropogenic features. So coral, for example, is sometimes referred to as either a rock or a plant rather than as an animal. And the uncertainty around and the undervaluing of moths can have a direct impact on people's ability to form a connection with them. Awesome. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about what we know about how people connect with animals. So a growing body of literature suggests that wildlife conservation hinges on people making personal connections with animals. The problem is that we also know that our interactions with wild animals are decreasing largely due to biodiversity loss. Increasingly, we are turning to technology, now to AI, um, but, but to imagery broadly to find these connections with animals. We also know that how we depict animals in images and texts uh, has implications for public perception and conservation. So for instance, uh, Linda Kaloff and I have shown that animal portraits, portraits and anthropomorphic texts can increase empathy for animals and may help in promoting conservation behaviors. However, historically, there has been concern about the use of anthropomorphism to depict animals, uh, especially among zoos and aquariums. This is largely because when the term anthropomorphism is used, most people think of classical anthropomorphism. Um, and that's, we assume that animals have the same feelings, needs, and reactions that humans do. This is problematic because it does not consider biological differences between humans and animals. For example, from a classical anthropomorphism perspective, an animal's inability to speak could be considered a lack of intelligence instead of reflecting the realities that animals communicate through a variety of mechanisms that are different than humans. Today, zoos and aquariums use critical anthropomorphism to address animal well-being. Critical anthropomorphism is based in science and not folklore or direct human comparison. It is about seeing an animal's behavior through a lens of what we know about the species, similar species, and other individual variables like age, health, and social situation. Within this idea, we argue that sometimes we use tactics like animal portraiture, or anthropomorphized texts to elicit emotion from the viewer or reader, knowing that they are likely drawing on more classical anthropomorphic techniques to assess these images and texts. 
In this way, we may care less initially about their full understanding of the animal's behavior because we want them to make a personal connection with the animal first so that we can then provide additional education. While charismatic megafauna are anthropomorphized across zoos and aquariums, this has also led to substantial, of course, this has also led to substantial increases in fundings for a variety of species. So I have Fiona down there. Um, for those who don't know, Fiona was uh, a hippo born in the Cincinnati Zoo. She was premature. They nursed her. Um, and now I think she just turned seven, but she has raised hundreds of thousands um, for hippo conservation. So the point being in this um, is that depicting moths, anthropomorphizing moths is, is really challenging. Of the literature that does exist that looks at how uh, moths are anthropomorphized to develop a human connection, most of it resides in the depiction of cartoon characters like you see here. Uh, this is Patrick the Sea Star from SpongeBob and not really um, how this applies to real animals. This is likely because anthropomorphizing animals without faces is hard. So our first question really in the study was to assess to what degree are moths being anthropomorphized and how are they being anthropomorphized? We then wanted to do a broad analysis to identify themes among profiles. And so now let's go ahead and talk about uh, the materials and the methods. So there are 237 AZA accredited zoos and aquariums in the US. Um, obviously, we could not go to every one of these, so we had to figure out another way to get our data. So we chose to analyze the websites of all of these organizations, and we chose three distinct moths to look for, sea stars, jellies, and corals. We picked these three moths, not necessarily because they are the most important moths, but because they are some of the most recognizable. Additionally, additionally, there is no broad uh, love or disdain for these animals. Overall, these animals are considered aesthetically pleasing and generally beneficial to ecosystems. Although we do recognize, and as, as Caitlin pointed out, uh, jelly broom, blooms are becoming an issue, uh, but this is not an issue that the majority of the population is aware of. We assumed that the general favorability or neutrality that people have for these creatures would mean that they would be more likely to be profiled on websites so that a reasonable sample could be gathered. We gathered all profiles, which included text and image, and uploaded them to the qualitative program Atlas TI, and that's where we did all the coding and analysis. We started our analysis with a deductive approach using predetermined themes around anthropomorphism, looking for individuality, specifically looking to see if any of the profiles profiled individuals with names, with pronouns, with other characteristics. We then initiated an inductive approach to look for themes that were not predetermined. This allowed us to see emerging patterns. So what did we find? Let's start with the descriptive statistics here. So among the 237 um, AZA zoos and aquariums, we determined that 125 or a little over 55% had at least one aqu aquatic exhibit. Of the 125 zoos and aquariums with aquatic exhibits, less than half, about 44%, profiled sea stars, corals, or jellies on their websites. Some organizations depicted more than one moth, bringing our total sample to 89 profiles. Jellies were profiled the most, making up 41%, making up 41 of the 89, or about 46%, as you can see on the, on the chart here. Sea stars were featured 27 times, about 30%. And despite facing the greatest conservation concern among the three selected animals, corals were profiled only 21 times, or just 24%. These results are consistent with past research findings showing that less charismatic animals are less likely to be published in research and mentioned in media. And coral are clearly the least charismatic of these three animals. Although traces of anthropomorphism did exist, there was no depiction of any of these animals as individuals, no names, no pronouns, no discussion of individuals at all. There was only discussion of the species broadly or of group behavior. We then reviewed all the text and images numerous times and identified five prominent themes. These themes were not mutually exclusive. They include scientific social distancing, beautiful and eye-catching, 
grotesque, otherworldly, and strange, brainless beauties and objects of entertainment. We will discuss each of these themes over the next few slides. Caitlin? Thank you, Cam. So our first and most prominent theme that emerged from the analysis of the data was scientific social distancing. And this is the emotional distance created between the animal and the visitor by a preference for scientific facts. And these facts may be inadequate for fostering an emotional connection. Uh, all 89 profiles examined in this study emphasized facts about the animal, such as its scientific name, its average size, its average lifespan, habitat, etc. And none of the profiles examined in this study included any kind of individualizing frame for any one animal. Oftentimes, in the case of more charismatic megafauna, animals will be profiled on the organization website with a personalized name, as we saw with Fiona, and kind of a story to go along with them. However, moths do not appear to be regularly named or given featured stories. An example of a moth profile can be seen here on the left, and this is in kind of a, a list format, just giving facts about the animal. And then another example can be seen here on the right. And this is also fleshing out scientific facts about the animal. It's just in a longer paragraph format. And uh, while facts are essential and all descriptions should ideally be rooted in fact, uh, these profiles both lack any sort of individualization that would help connect the reader to an animal. A preference for facts over a focus on individuals may diminish viewer connection by implying that these animals are not individuals. And facts without context may contribute to the psychological distance between the viewer and the animal. Further, zoos and aquariums do seem to recognize the limitations of purely fact-based text. Um, because in their animal profiles, they often also include additional text that puts emphasis on an animal's beauty. Thank you. The inherent attractiveness of these animals was highlighted in 29 out of 89 profiles, or about 33%. This included three sea stars, 18 jellies, and eight corals. These profiles describe animals as beautiful, colorful, or otherwise eye-catching. Profiles focused on the animals as a group rather than individuals, a consistent theme that you're seeing here. The websites often include an invitation for people to connect to the quality of beauty, such as come see these beautiful animals close up as they drift gracefully through the water, bodies illuminated by the changing colored lights. Such statements encourage the observer to admire the creature for their beauty and as part of a collective almost like you would admire a bouquet of flowers where a singular flower becomes secondary to the group. Research shows that people connect to individuals over groups when making determinations about addressing an issue or providing help. In his book, The More Who Die, The Less Who Care, social psychologist Paul Slovic notes that we are drawn to stories of individuals as helping an individual is more cognitively plausible than being able to help an entire group. Although his book focuses on humans, the connection to animals is evident in the main stories of an individual animals that draw our attention, such as Fiona. Um, while emphasizing an animal's beauty is unlikely to have a negative impact on perception, minimizing the individual to emphasize the group may diminish personal connection. While 29 profiles highlighted the beauty of moths, a nearly identical, or 27, 30%, emphasized the grotesque, otherworldly, or strange nature of these animals. Sea stars had 15 profiles and jellies had 12 profiles. There were no corals in this group. One profile uh, depicting jellies noted, quote, the mouth is also the ooh. It's true, a jelly's mouth is also, also serves as its anus. The added commentary about the animal's bodily function draws attention to the grotesque. Another noted, quote, the sea star will then extend its stomach out through its mouth and into the clam. The sea star, uh, while this statement is scientifically accurate without added commentary about the grotesque, this profile still highlights the strangeness of this animal. Both profiles, both profiles feature information designed to elicit an emotional response, highlighting strangeness or difference instead of drawing attention to the similarities we share with these creatures. The remaining profiles situated these animals as distinctly different from humans or almost alien-like. 
For instance, a statement about Jelly's notes, they have no bones, no nervous system, brain or muscles are 97% water and nobody knows how they move. While these depictions may spark interest, the overall effect may be one that really actually diminishes the connection or concern we have for these creatures. Brainless beauties. At the intersection of the beautiful and the strange is this kind of depiction of the brainless beauty. At least three profiles or 7% use this specific phrase, brainless beauty, as a descriptor. Uh, these were all applied to jellies. For instance, one of the nation's largest aquariums that you can see here titles their, their entire jelly page as brainless beauties. They then describe jellies as, quote, one of na Mother Nature's strangest wonders. Another aquarium describes jellies as, quote, these brainless, boneless, bloodless beauties. Many institutions had slight modifications to this phrasing that significantly changed the meaning. Historically, the use of brainless beauty was a term applied to women who were thought to be unintelligent or ditzy. The use of the term brainless specifically may not be so bad considering that jellies do not have what we would identify as a brain, but this coupled with the beauties part has a specific connotation in society. To see if this connotation is still holding true in society, um, we decided to do a little survey experiment. We added some questions onto a short MTurk study to assess how people interpreted brainless beauty. We got 312 responses. 92% of people said that it was a negative term that was mostly applied to women. And 89% of women found the term to be somewhat or always uncomfortable in any context. So, whether visitors are interpreting this language as a gendered microaggression, uh, we don't know. That has not been studied, nor has the impact this language has on perceptions of jellies specifically. Of course, these are things that should be evaluated. Instead of using brainless beauties, uh, one aquarium settled on boneless beauties. While the use of boneless uh, or bloodless used by another aquarium highlight differences between moths and humans, these terms do not hold the same weight or derogatory or negative, negative mean that brainless does. Caitlin? Thank you. Um, our final theme is objects of touch. Oftentimes depictions that refer to the animals as beautiful also emphasize their value as entertainment. And entertainment can come in a variety of manners, including but not being limited to uh, photo opportunities or backdrops. Uh, one quote was, quote, learn about the anatomy and behavior of the jellyfish and take photos of yourself and your family at this exhibit with the jellies. Um, they can also be uh, used as interactive touch exhibits. Uh, quote, the aquarium's moon jelly touch habitat is the only one of its kind, is sure to wow kids and adults alike. And then finally, uh, we've seen an increased emphasis on habitat, quote, touch experiences, yellow stingrays, anemones, a sea star, and pencil urchins are among the natural wonders that inhabit the habitat with touch experiences for visitors. So 19 total entries um, of the profiles collected fit this theme with 12 jelly profiles and three profiles each for coral and sea stars. It is important to make a distinction between photo opportunities and touch exhibits because while both are entertaining, interactive exhibits have been known to foster empathy between the visitors and the animals because the interactivity showcases the animal's agency and needs. Um, it must also be noted that oftentimes during guided interactive exhibits, staff members can emphasize additional information about how the touch impacts the animal, and they can also answer visitor questions about what steps are being taken to protect and support the animals. However, this is only offered in the in-person experience. This information isn't listed on the website. And so coupled with an emphasis on the animal's beauty and strangeness, the omission of this information may lead the public to believe that these animals are objects of entertainment rather than individual and complex creatures. So all of the themes above that we've discussed may be limiting the possible connections and concern that visitors are able to form with moths. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some of our conclusions. So 
we know that the public understanding and empathy for moths is really limited, especially when compared to that of charismatic megafauna. We also know that marine animals without faces are some of the most important animals uh, in the ecosystem, and that about 90% of marine organisms are invertebrates, and many of those do not have faces. And about 20% of all of these are facing extinction. In fact, many people uh, aren't even sure if these are animals. AZA accredited zoos and aquariums could help to significantly alter how people think about moths and engage with moths. However, after reviewing these websites, it seems that current profiles may not be having the desired impact. Currently, over 56% of organizations with marine exhibits uh, do not profile jellies, sea stars, or corals, and they are likely not profiling other moths since these are some of the most uh, prominent and recognizable. Corals, for example, were the least likely to be profiled, but remain one of the animals of greatest concern. Among those organizations that profiled moths on their websites, five themes emerged, scientific social distancing, beautiful and eye-catching, grotesque, otherworldly and strange, brainless beauties, and objects of touch and entertainment. None of these themes specifically help people make a personal connection with these animals. And although we didn't test it, some of these themes may actually uh, create a barrier for connection. There were no profiles that depicted individual stories with names or pronouns of these animals. All profiles gave general information about the species or about uh, collective behavior. So now that we know uh, how moths are being depicted currently, we can consider what impact these depictions are having on viewers and what type of profiles may work better. Studies should be conducted to assess uh, how visitors are interpreting different terms, such as brainless beauty, and how this engages their connection with the animals. We also know that it is very hard to anthropomorphize moths. And so more research is needed to figure out exactly what mechanisms can we use to use anthropomorphism in a strategic or a critical way to get people better connected with these animals. So as with all studies, there are a number of limitations. The first one being that we could not visit all of these zoos and aquariums. So although websites are important um, organizational tools, they are not the only apparatus that conservation organizations are using to communicate information about animals. Um, what is presented on the website may or may not interface with the signage and other features of the organization. Additional studies should be done to assess if there is consistency across branding for different animals and what this looks like. Future work should also identify ways, as I mentioned, that moths could be profiled and how uh, we could do that in deliberate and strategic ways to get people to better connect to these animals. Thank you all so much for listening today. Uh, we're gonna open up the floor now um, for moderated questions and yeah, discussion. Cool. Thank you both so much for that fabulous um, presentation. Um, could I ask you to stop sharing the screen right now? Yes. Thank you. There you go. All right. So now we will open up the floor for questions. We do have one request already in the chat, if it's possible to, ch to share the article that you mentioned. Yeah. So um, it is in process and will be sent out for publication probably in the next week, but we can share it as long as you won't share it. That makes sense um, until it's published. Yeah. Um, so, um, Johanna, I'll let you message your, um, maybe message your email address and I to me, and I'll save that and pass it along to the speakers um, afterward. All right, so um, what I would like to do is if you have a question, if you could just use the little hand raisey icon that makes it really easy in the Zoom room because it puts you all in order that you had your questions and I'll moderate the chat for those of you who... Uh, might just want to type your questions and I'll make sure that I get those in there. So our first um, question is from Audrey. Audrey, I'll let you have the floor. Hi, uh, thank you so much for such a wonderful presentation. 
I'm learning so much. I just wanted you to say a little bit more about the difference between classic and uh, critical anthropomorphism. I'm just having a little trouble wrapping my mind around that. So uh, just a few sentences of clarity would be really appreciated. Sure. Um, do you want me to do that, Caitlin? Does that work? Absolutely. Go for it. Yeah. yeah. Um, so with classical anthropomorphism, so this is the idea that animals respond and engage in the world exactly how we do. And if they don't have or if they are unable to do those sorts of things, um, that they have deficiencies in some context. So what what zoos and aquariums and people in general have turned to is more of a critical anthropomorphism where we recognize that we put things our own social understanding of the world onto animals. So we are interpreting what animals are doing and who they are and how they move and all these things from our own lens as humans, but that we also need to look at all these other components. We need to look at the, the species. What do we know about the species and the science that has been done to look at the species? What do we know about this individual animal? So um, you know, part of critical anthropomorphism is also saying that we can't apply broad um, statements to a whole group of animals and that animals may interact and engage in different ways based on context. So how an, inter how an animal interacts in a zoo is going to be different than how they would be um, in a shelter versus how they'd be in a sanctuary versus how they'd be in the wild. And so to be critical of what we are putting on to these animals um, in every context. And we do that because, um, you know, we find that having a critical anthropomorphic perspective really helps us think about the welfare of the animal in, in a better way, um, specifically in a zoo and aquarium context, so that they can look at the individual, they can draw on this idea of species, what, what are the natural behaviors, what does that look like, and really kind of put that all together. Um, so I've come along and I I bring up this term strategic anthropomorphism because I think sometimes when like the work I do looking at animal imagery and we're using animal portraits is that it it kind of involves all of this stuff because I know when I use an animal portrait and an animal, maybe an animal is, you know, sloped down like this. And as a human, we would interpret that as a depressed animal or a sad animal. But depending on the animal, that could be an animal that feels relaxed, an animal that feels calm. So we are seeing a space where I am strategically using how I know people will interpret an image, even if it's slightly out of context, to enhance that connection, to then be able to provide more information about this animal and to do greater education. So I I, it fits, I I think like strategic anthropomorphism really fits within critical anthropomorphism, but it's also slightly different in how um, we are thinking about things and the recognition that people are coming at this stuff a lot of times from a more traditional anthropomorphic place, unless they have been trained in critical anthropomorphism. Does that help? It does. <laughs> it really, it, thank you so much. Uh, and you just said that off the top of your head. Awesome. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. We have a lot of questions rolling in. Um, I'm going to try to take them probably in order. Um, but if I can figure out a way to synthesize anything in the chat for the two of you, I will. Um, but I think Mona's hand was up next. So Mona, as I hear, we'll turn it over to you for your question. Hi, thanks. Uh, thanks for the presentation. I was wondering to what extent it, they actually are like individuals, especially coral. I, I don't know enough about them, but what are some of like the individual traits or features that could be highlighted? Yeah, that is a great question. Um, thank you so much for asking that. Um, an example of something I came across, there was a couple of really great examples of anthropomorphization on some organization websites. Uh, one of them, for example, is um, bat stars are kind of territorial, and they'll do this thing where they try to clamber on top of each other to kind of assert like who gets to be there. And on the website, they talked about it like the sea stars were engaging in an arm wrestling match of some kind. So just kind of like making those connections between experiences we have as humans and kind of uh, relating them to the experiences that individual animals might have. Um, that sort of thing is helpful. That was something that I saw. 
And then another way is just using um, kind of empathetic language. Uh, we got the opportunity to work with the Seattle Cram and their Beach Naturalist program. And we got to see firsthand uh, when someone is, you know, picking up a rock to view an animal that is living underneath the rock, you know, referring to that as the animal's home and just kind of using em empathetic based language and then also relating it a lot um, because there are definitely some things like with coral that it's it's hard to relate our experiences as humans to the experiences of, of coral organisms. Um, but just trying to bridge those gaps as best we can using language, if that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. So do you think that um, like individualizing them and anthropomorphizing them, like, is there, uh, are those like the same thing? Or do you feel like you can anthropomorphize whatever without individualizing or vice versa? Ooh, that's really interesting. I'm trying to think about that. Because I do feel like, you know, with coral organisms, a lot of the time, you know, you'll have several different coral species, all kind of, you know, living almost as one together and kind of like cohabitating in a single area. Um, and so I think that's really interesting. And I wonder if there would be a way to anthropomorphize coral, but still taking note of the fact that they do operate kind of in a in a collective manner together. So yeah, that, that's really interesting. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I can say something quickly too. Thank you, Caitlin, for that. Um, I, you know, this is this is kind of a bigger project where um, we're trying to figure out what works best and what does work, what doesn't work, how we talk about coral, how we talk about uh, moths in general. And so, you know, when we were conceptualizing this, the first thought was like, well, how are we talking about it? So we're, we're at that stage, like, how are we talking about this? And then the next stage is like, okay, well, here are some different examples that we found and let's do some pilot testing to see how people react to these different things. Um, you know, I think from a personal perspective, like with coral, step one for me is for to people to understand that these are not rocks, these are animals. And so, you know, like getting, just getting that shift, I think would help significantly in, instead of thinking about the majority of people think that these, these are rocks or not animals in general. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to bring us to um, a question on the chat before I hop over to Ken's question. We have two things in the chat that kind of, I don't know, um, kind of go along with you thinking about how we can, we can, I don't know, anthropomorphize and get empathy for these animals. One yeah. question is whether you've thought about sighted invertebrates. Um, and, you know, those distinctions. And the other is if you've ever found research that having like weird or grotesque features might enhance empathy in some way. Um, the person is, Robin says, I realize that it makes critical anthropomorphism more challenging, but I'm thinking of everyone I know who has tremendous empathy and respect for non-human animals who often have has a favorite weird fact they love to share and be excited about. So eyes, we have them. Have you looked at those animals? And then what about like the the more weird stuff? Does that help as well? Yeah. Um, do you want me to start, Caitlin? Sure, go uh, ahead. Um, so yeah, we're actually doing a project right now with invertebrates um, and, and doing an online survey experiment showing people different invertebrates, um, some with eyes, some without eyes, um, and getting kind of some baseline data around how people interpret these animals. So I don't have the data uh, quite yet, but that is in the works and that's what we're doing. Um, I think there will be a difference because we do see, you know, what, what we have seen in terms of how these an animals are anthropomorphized, not necessarily with zoos and aquariums, but across other organizations is, all, is often in cartoon form. Or uh, the other thing that Caitlin can talk more about is um, like putting eyes directly on the animal. Um, and so giving them some, giving them like giving starfish eyes. Uh, and so we we have seen things that are being done like that, whether or not that works. I mean, who knows? But uh, that's that's kind of what we've seen. And then what's the second part of that question? Um, the question is, um, have you found research ex suggesting that information that interprets animals as weird, otherworldly, or grotesque is a barrier or maybe not a barrier to connection? Yeah, no, I think this is a really interesting idea. And it's something that I've been thinking about 
I don't know of any research that specifically addresses that. Um, I think there's like a, a critical boundary around how we um, discuss that information, whether that information is like a cool, weird fact, like look at this cool thing this animal can do, or it's like a um, disgusting thing that this animal and it kind of like a, we have a repulsion against this animal. So I think we like it kind of this would be my guess that it's going to depend on how that is framed and in, in kind of in what context. Thank you. And I think Ken has had his hand up for a while. So Ken, we'll go to you. Perfect. Thanks. Uh, great presentation. Um, I live uh, around the Bay of Funday and where I live, there's a, uh, there's a lot of aquatic parks. And in these parks, there's, there's uh, wading pools and stuff for kids to go in. And um, what they're able to do in there is handle stuff like mollusks and, and starfish and stuff like that. And I'm just wondering, have you seen much of that and what your thoughts are on that? like people handling the animals while they're in enclosures mm -hmm. um yeah we uh some of our partners at the seattle aquarium you know they were talking about how um getting hands-on experience and getting to interact with these animals can foster a lot more empathy and understanding because when you're holding this animal or when you're interacting with it you're getting to see its, you know, its response to your touch and you're, it kind of highlights the animal's agency. And so I, I do definitely think that it is uh, something that, that fosters connection. Um, something that is specifically the Seattle Aquarium has been trying to be cognizant of is, um, you know, uh, touching gently, <laughs> I guess, you know, and like that there is probably some ways that, you know, um, children may interact with, you know, mollusks or, or anemones that is harmful to the animal and just making sure that, you know, we were, we're being gentle, we're being respectful and like, we're coming in with empathy and with understanding when we're trying to interact with these other animals, if that makes sense. So the only thing I would add to that, um, is that Caitlin and I were involved in <clears throat> doing assessments uh, working with the CL Aquarium to do an assessment of their beach naturalist program that basically all summer long, they have um, at low tide, they have beach naturalists across all these different beaches that provide both scientific information and empathy messaging. And the goal around that is to really um, try to get people to engage with their natural environment, but also out of to have respect for that environment and to understand the individuality of these different creatures. Uh, so we do see a lot of that. And we do, when we did the study, basically what we, what we were saying is how do people react to um, just purely scientific information about the animals on the beach? And then how do they react to empathy driven information with scientific information. So it's not about that, you know, we're not just eliminating the science. And what we do see is that the people who had the empathy information talked about individual animals in this really interesting way. And the people who had the scientific information talked about individual naturalists. So the impact on them was about the naturalists versus with the empathy, I and the empathy messaging, they were able to actually connect with these animals that then they wanted to talk about. So yeah, we it's super it's super exciting um, to kind of see those different components. Thank you. And Will has had their hand up for a while, so I'll let Will ask their question. Uh, thank you very much for this very interesting talk. Um, my question is about uh, your choice of trying to make a moral connection or an empathy connection with animals that I, if I understand, really don't want to have connection with us, we're predators, or at least we're, we're moving their, their places. And so it's really questioning for me, why do we, why do we, you push a moral connection or an empathic connection with animals that really don't want to, because the, the bigger question is, uh, in regards to incentives, like uh, the Wanganui uh, River in New Zealand, that was mm -hmm. given uh, moral uh, identity. I don't know so how to say it in English. Um, would it not be more interesting to to create an empathic relationship to the to the ocean or to the place where they live, to to try and build a relationship with 
all the environment and not only the individuals because it's like if we're creating a false a false uh, relation with individuals as they're not and they're really personalities within uh, context and environment i'm not sure if my question is clear is it, is it sufficient? thank you very much yeah do you want me to start caitlin um sure go ahead yeah. um yeah i mean that's a that's a question that i struggle with all the time like why why are we doing this um for me it's really about it's about this broader concern about conservation and we know that in order to get people to care about different animals they have to have a personal connection so it's about figuring out ways to highlight that personal connection personally um do i you know it's not a it, for me, it's not about individuals having a one-on-one -on -one relationship with sea stars where they have a sea star at their home or whatever, but it's more about people recognizing that all animals have individuality and that, and that recognition. So that when we think about a polar bear, right, that a sea star is just as valuable as a polar bear, even though we don't put that same value necessarily in, in society, we don't have that same social value for this animal, but we should. Like these moths are critically important to ecosystems. And if we don't get people connected um, on this like individual level, we know that people aren't connecting to like a group, right? But if we get people really connected to these individuals, you know, like with the story with Fiona, um, we had, we have hundreds of thousands of people, probably millions of people connected with Fiona, this hippo at the Cincinnati Zoo, who was born premature and her story. And that has raised a massive amount of money for the conservation of hippos. And so if we can think about similar ways, and, and like I follow Fiona all the time, and I'm probably never going to meet Fiona. And yet I've still donated to hippo conservation because of Fiona. So if we can have similar mechanisms that we can use um, to get people to connect to these animals that are less charismatic, that's what I'm I'm really interested in. Um, having people connect to the ocean in general, yes. Having people connect to these broader, con yes, all of those things. Um, when we think about conservation, it's, you know, it's all hands on deck. We have to think about how do we connect people in, in a variety of different ways. And in some cases, someone like yourself may connect, be able to connect with a broader like ocean. But in other cases, I don't think all individuals are able to have that, have that connection. Thank you. Um, well, you answered a question in the chat to there, Cam, um, because Eleanor, Eleanor, uh, Eleanor said, individualization, as I understand it, about is about finding similarities and differences. I'm not sure that individualization does help us understand animals that are more group oriented. And then they go on to say, maybe part of the answer of how to represent moths is to express both similarities and differences with human animals. So I wonder if you have anything to add um, in light of that comment and question. Sure. Yeah, uh -huh. I think... Um... Just to like hop in here real quick, I think something uh -huh. that originally sparked my interest in this and that wanted or made me want to get, you know, involved with like invertebrates and moths specifically was kind of addressing the fact that um, when an animal is less like us, um, it seems to hold less value, you know, and just kind of addressing that like anthrocentrism. Um, and so I think animals that are you know, uh, more group oriented, um, you know, that we are like kind of individuals, you know, humans. <laughs> um, and so I think that that's, you know, there's an even wider gap there that they are even less similar to us in that way. And so I think that makes it even more important to try to like bridge that gap in understanding and in empathy. So. Um, Eleanor, yeah, I love this question. Um, you know, I think, I think like what you hit on is critical anthropomorphism, right? Like that's the idea that we have to reckon, like we're we're trying to build these similarities, but we also have to recognize that there are differences and really highlight those differences as well. Um, but I think we can also highlight those differences um, in empathy oriented language in, in different ways. So um, I think, you know, I, yeah, I do think it's valuable to talk about the connections, but also to talk about the, the things that are 
different from us for sure. <laughs> Thank you so much. And with that, we only have a few minutes left. So, um, Caitlin, uh, Cam, is there anything that you would like to say before we wrap up today? Um, um, yeah, I would just love to say thank you again for everyone for your wonderful questions and your discussion and your time. Um, it is really great to, you know, be in a space where everyone is so interested and so caring on this subject that I think is very near and dear to me. Um, so yeah, just thank you all very much. Um, and I would just like to to second that. Thank you all for for having us here and also for rescheduling when I was so sick. I was like, I don't know if I can do this. Um, so I really appreciate that so that we could show up um, and both be fully present in this. Um, the other thing I just want to say is I want to thank Caitlin for all the work that she did on this um, and for her immense like knowledge of MOFs. Um, Caitlin could give multiple uh, talks about moths in general and specific moths, which is really, really phenomenal and neat. And so, um, you know, within this community, I think Caitlin will probably be a rising star that we will see um, involved in ASA and, and sociology in the future. So I think that's wonderful. So thank you. Well, thank both of you for such a wonderful talk. Um, there's some question in the chat. Will there be a recording? Yes, with all of our events, um, when there is a recording ready, everyone who registered is sent the recording of the event. Some people, I know there, I got a lot of emails from people who registered but couldn't make the rescheduling. Um, so we will be, everyone who's here and everyone who registered and who's not here will get a recording, but also in those links we sent you at the top of the chat, um, you can, um, sign up here. I'll redrop it in the chat at this link right here. You can sign up um, to get announcements of our next colloquium and you can see all the recordings of our past colloquium. We unfortunately don't currently have our next colloquium scheduled. Usually we do, but it's been kind of a wonky, a wonky um, spring semester here. And we sincerely apologize for that, but we will be emailing everyone as soon as we can. So with that, thank you so much to um, Cameron and to Caitlin for all of their work and such a wonderful talk. And thank you for this audience for showing up and asking such great questions and being a part of this event. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you. Cool.